In a moment, Mr. Greenblatt will talk about his book, but before he will do so, I would like to present to you David, 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 he has some followers here, is a classicist at the city's Barleus Gymnasium, Gymnasium and a publicist for, amongst others, NRC Handelsblad. Mr. Reiser will introduce Mr. Greenblatt and conduct the interview um, with a, a discussion on stage here and after um, some time you are also in, in, asked to, um, to involve in the discussion. Tonight we will have an intermission. Mr. Greenblatt told me his um, throat is a little bit sore, so after his talk we'll have a little break for 10 minutes to um, have give him the chance to have some uh, hot tea. So uh, for now, may I ask you to switch off mobile phones and can I ask David to take the floor? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, hearty welcome to all of you who have been so generous to attend this evening with Stephen Greenblatt, whom we have the great pleasure to have in our midst this evening. I look, very, uh, look forward very much to his lecture later on and hope for a lively discussion, which I think uh, will be possible with this attendance uh, afterwards. In this introduction, I will eventually come to the occasion of tonight's gathering, Professor Greenblatt's latest book on the life of enumeration of the publications, honors, and titles Professor Greenblatt has assembled, concluding with his present appointment as Professor of Literature at Harvard, an immensely prestigious chair. But alas, that would to take too much of my time. Thus it is perhaps more opportune to try and determine broadly what is the importance of Greenblatt as a scholar and as an author? As you may well know, Professor Greenblatt is a celebrity in the scholarly world. That means famous to some, infamous to others. Admiration, though, predominates. He's widely admired for erudition, resourcefulness, and creativity. He has an immense bibliography to his name, concentrating on the Renaissance, and within this field on Shakespeare. But his scholarship exceeds narrow bounds. Apart from on Shakespeare, he has written on Christopher Columbus, on Sir Walter Raleigh, on Thomas More, on War Orwell and Huxley as modern satirists, but also on tantalizingly curious subjects as cursing or bread, or fascinating, fascinatingly important ones as purgatory. Even more important, perhaps, is the fact that he may be considered the auctor intellectualis of an influential movement in cultural history, which is called New Historicism. And it is precisely this movement, if thus it may be termed, for there is no formal connection between the scholars who subscribe to Greenblatt's ideas, this movement which lies at the core of the debate on the extremely important question of how we handle our cultural heritage, a question which is all the more topical today in the Netherlands a society in turmoil, bickering over tradition and renewal. As an historian of Renaissance culture and literature, Greenblatt has pleaded that we look not only at the towering masterpieces, but also at the detail that surrounds them. As an historian of Renaissance culture and literature, Greenblatt has pleaded that we look not only at the towering masterpieces, but also at the detail that surrounds them. For as my class, uh, fellow classicist von Wilamowicz Mullendorf remarked long ago, der liebe Gott steckt im Detail. The idea was to create a living, everyday context for historical literature, to elucidate more properly both literature and the surrounding life, and to take away the inaccessibility of literature and literary culture to place it, so to say, in the world. Some of you will perhaps see in their mind's eye at this moment the looming image of Karl Marx. They are not wholly amiss. I will come to speak of Dr. Marx later on. For now, I must stress that, yes, new historicism is affiliated with social democratic standpoints, but no, not with political correctness. Political engagement is not the whole point of new historicism. In fact, within the context of the reign of theory in ac academical culture in which new historicism emerged, it had a more or less conservative impact. 
its slogan might be termed Ad Fontes. The point was that the fontes, or sources, were defined differently. The impulse of the new historicists to get down to basics was, I think, not primarily in intended as an attack on the canon, the great uh, list of great admired works, although some iconoclastic impulse may have been part of the fun in the beginning. It was, in fact, an elaboration and amplification of the method used by the famous and erudite German scholar Erich Auerbach in his study Mimesis, a fabulous book that some of you will know, others will hope, hopefully get to know, and a book I think Mr. Greenblatt ardently admires, as I do myself. But where Auerbach had concentrated on setting the masterpieces of literature into perspective, Greenblatt and his peers searched not only for text, but for anecdotes, or, in fact, for any scrap of historical evidence that might reveal the historical reality in which the writers of these masterpieces were, for the most part, deeply engaged. If, as Auerbach proposed, literature is about a representation of reality, what then was, for instance, the relation between Montaigne's essays, written seemingly detached from the world, in search for an identity, the relation between these essays and the violent religious struggles which caused him to be so skeptic of this identity. To find out, the new historicists, historicists suggested, we must gather detail, even detail up till now considered unworthy of serious attention. And thus the whole culture, and not only the text, the whole culture became a text as it were. The non-specialist may consult the Norton Shakespeare, co-edited by Greenblatt, to get an idea of the staggering results this approach has produced. The introductions to the plays of Shakespeare are full of new and highly revealing material on the world in which these plays were made and which gave the impulse to their creation. This edition should not be absent on the writing desk of any Shakespeare lover. This shift of emphasis resulted in new light on old masters. Indeed, new historicists were critical of the cultural honor roll. There, there were not only minor poets instead of the major ones worth considering, but the minor ones too, even non-poets or even pedestrian incidents could become highly noteworthy. This has caused cons considerable controversy, a commotion I find strange because we classicists have practiced new historicism whenever we could for nearly 200 years. But, as you know, an author like Shakespeare was considered a saint. That is, he was considered larger than life. To some, it thus seemed perverse putting Shakespeare's feet on the ground. Mr. Greenblatt has consequently been accused of the most horrible crimes, as iconoclasts are often accused. His arrival to come and teach at Harvard was characterized by someone as a brain tumor entering the faculty. <laughs> Such unwarranted attacks only serve to illustrate the enormous aggression a gifted scholar with an unconventional approach may cause, even in the land of the free and the brave, or is it the brave and the free? It is interesting to note that Shakespeare himself, as we learn from Mr. Greenblatt's latest book, has similar experiences, and this is something we may talk about later. But we need, however, not to be needlessly alarmed. Mr. Greenblatt's reputation has emerged triumphantly from the brawl and stands unscathed, especially since this book. For it was with an audible sigh of relief that conservative critics have reacted to will in the world. Naturally, for it concerns Shakespeare, the poet they venerated, and not the contents of dustbins which they abhorred. And finally, too, the public at large has heard proclaimed what academics knew all along, that Mr. Greenblatt is a gifted writer. Indeed, reading this learned, amusing, and exciting book, I was reminded of a review of another fellow classicist, the poet scholar A. E. Hausman. Reviewing a textual edition by the classicist Marx, not your Marx, Mr. Greenblatt, but the namesake, a, a, an edition of the Roman poet Lucilius, 
The textual tradition of Lucilius is notoriously fragmentary, and Marx's edition of these fragments was highly, highly speculative, eliciting the venom of Hausmann, who began his review with the ominous words, cautious men do not edit Lucilius, <laughs> and concluded with a flourish, Mr. Marx should write a novel. Nay, he may be said to have already done so. That was the end of a beautiful career, that of Marx, that is. Hausmann was a positivistic critic, and nothing but the truth, and the truth alone, satisfied him. What Greenblatt attempts in his Will in the World is to show how limited such an approach actually is, and the life of Shakespeare, our knowledge of which is just as notoriously fragmentary, has now become the touchstone of the utility of Greenblatt's method. For, in the absence of personal documents, the only way to approach the shadowy figure of Shakespeare, who has left us with hardly anything more than a few signatures, notary acts, and financial transactions, is by circumstantial evidence, precisely the sort of evidence that new historicism sought to bring to bear on historical literature. The book, indeed, reads like a novel. The number of assumptions and tentative inferences is astonishing, and even this number makes it a veritable tour de force. It seems as if the miracle Shakespeare has performed with his characters in the theater, Mr. Greenblatt now performs with the bard himself. In his pages, he comes miraculously to life. But this is not a novel. The premises of this book are the result of hard-won scholarship and not the flights of fancy. This scholarship proceeds to elucidate many, if not all, the blind spots in the career of the most famous and less known poet of our tradition since Homer, Shakespeare. These blind spots not only touch upon biographical detail, they are highly relevant for the work itself. Shakespeare's famous opacity of motive, for instance, the curious phenomenon that he transforms characters with clear motives in his sources to characters without clear motives in his plays, a characteristic which renders these characters incredibly lifelike and realistic, had been brilliant, brilliantly noticed and analyzed, for, for instance, by Jonathan Bate, but it was never convincingly explained. Now Greenblatt comes with a biographical explanation. In Shakespeare's associations with Catholicism, and the experience of the religious climate of Protestant Britain and its concomitant terror. For the first time, too, the relation between Shakespeare and his father, his wife, his son Hamnet, becomes almost tangible. We learn to look behind the scenes of his most famous characters and are invited to see the ancestry of Falstaff or the cause of Hamlet's pessimism. Most interestingly, Greenblatt, by following the money and thereby using fine American precedent, gives us insight in Shakespeare's deepest motives and anxieties. Money, it appears, is incredibly important in Shakespeare's biography, and the notary acts deemed unworthy of attention by former biographers prove essential after all. There remain questions, of course. These we will leave for the talk afterwards. Let us first listen to Professor Greenblatt's lecture. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> uh, let me first apologize <coughs> for the absurd state of my voice. Uh, I'm going to put this up cl close. I, I somehow lost my voice between yesterday and, to <coughs> and today. Uh, you can let me know if I'm completely inaudible. Uh, but I'll do my best. <clears throat> I want to thank um, Luke Knappen and the John Adams Institute uh, for hosting this wonderful occasion. I want to thank uh, David Riese for this uh, wonderful, elegant, ironic, and delicious introduction. Um, <clears throat> it sometimes is the case, after all, it's the premise in some way of, of my book that it may be that someone else understands you <clears throat> better than you understand yourself. So I'm very, very grateful for that account. <clears throat> uh, William Shakespeare, and I'll try this a, f a few times to see if I can get going here. Let's see. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> William Shakespeare created <clears throat> the greatest <clears throat> body of imaginative literature in English, <clears throat> and perhaps in Western literature. But he was not, like Homer, a mythical figure, uh, forever in the shadows. He lived in historical time. <clears throat> he left records in the bureaucratic record-keeping culture of Elizabethan and Jacobean England. Mm. He is almost uh, within our grasp. I say in the uh, acknowledgments of my book that uh, between my son Harry's birth in 2001 and my father Harry, after whom my son is named, uh, birth in 1897 is 104 years. So you put four of those together and you're back in Shakespeare's time. It's 400 years is not nothing, I concede, uh, but it's, it's almost uh, within our grasp. <coughs> but the academic study <coughs> of literature in the mid-20th century <coughs> trained several generations of students, including my generation, to stay very far away from the biographical traces that Shakespeare left. <coughs> I went to Yale in the mid-1960s. Uh, mm -hmm. Yale at that time was <coughs> the uh, cathedral of uh, the formalist study of literature, <coughs> dominated by a view uh, that held <coughs> that historical and biographical, even more biographical, uh, contexts were anathema to the serious study <coughs> of literature. William K. Wimsatt, uh, and a philosopher named Monroe, uh, who was a literary critic, and a ph philosopher named Mar Monroe Beardsley wrote a famous essay in 1946 called The Intentional Fallacy that set the agenda. <coughs> they wrote that judging a poem is like judging a pudding or a machine. Now, if a poem is a pudding or a machine, if a play is a pudding or a machine, then it's obviously absurd to worry very much about uh, the life history of the person who cooked the pudding uh, or the uh, marriage, whether it was good or bad, of the person who built the machine. And there's much to be said for that kind of uh, erasure of the context of a work of art in order to look or attempt to look very hard simply at the thing itself. <coughs> but what if you don't think of plays and poems as puddings or as machines, or not only as uh, those admirable objects? What if you think of them as something else? What if you think of them uh, as letters that have been written to you, weirdly addressed to you by name, uh, by a dead person who couldn't possibly have known you. And yet when you open the letter you find has addressed you personally, has seized you, uh, and is trying to tell you something. If you feel anything like that, which is after all not a uh, fanciful and recent notion, but is what St. Paul felt about uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, that these letters, he says, were written for us. If you feel something like that uh, about the work of a dead uh, or distant writer, and it could be Kafka, uh, as well as Shakespeare, it doesn't have to be quite as distant as that, <coughs> then you feel uh, the need to uh, move at least uh, in a direction away from uh, the pudding uh, or the machine view. You feel that uh, the bracing formalism of the kind in which I was trained, and I'm grateful for being trained, needs to uh, be shouldered a little bit aside uh, by approaches more sympathetic to historical questions. <coughs> and this happened in the 1970s, 80s, and so forth, mm -hmm. not only for me, but for many uh, of my colleagues. But the admissible historical context remained, at least in the academic world, largely <coughs> impersonal. It was possible to think about social and cultural and political and religious contexts for literature. It was far less admissible <coughs> to think about life histories. Because after all, not only <coughs> did uh, historical scholarship, including Marxist scholarship, uh, hold up life histories to uh, coruscating skepticism, but postmodernism in the figures of Foucault, Barthes, and others. Uh, cast also a deeply skeptical view uh, of the idea of authorship itself. And it was far more, it was far safer, in any case you sounded more sophisticated, uh, to talk about the author function uh, 
than it was to talk about writers. <coughs> There's much to be gained from skepticism of this kind, <coughs> but it can't stop there. Uh, and at the same time that that skepticism <coughs> was being articulated and imbibed, popular interest in literary biography remained very high. Indeed, it is in the United States <coughs> almost the only conversation about literature that readers outside the academic world actually could stand and care about. <coughs> uh, and that interest in Shakespeare, particularly in Shakespeare's life, remained high. <coughs> because if you've been, as I say, seized by this work, if it means something to you, if you pick up and read Shakespeare's sonnets or go to a play not because you're assigned to do so uh, by a taskmaster, but because uh, you feel deep pleasure in it, then you want to know where did the person who wrote this, where did he come from? What were his parents like? Who were his friends? Who were his lovers? What did he read? What did he fear? What did he long for? And uh, perhaps also you want to know as I try to ask, though I can't fully answer <coughs> in this book, <coughs> how did he do it? How did he accomplish what he accomplished? So despite the current of academic fastidiousness for the last 50 years, <coughs> research into Shakespearean biography continu has continued uh, quite vigorously uh, with one book building uh, upon the last. The trouble is that stripped to the bare bones, the rehearsal of the basic core known facts about Shakespeare's life, uh, as uh, David Riesse said, I know I'm, ba I'm mangling your name horribly, but you'll forgive me. Uh, that rehearsal of the known facts uh, can be accomplished in about 15 minutes. So where are we then? And after the 15 minutes is up, what do we actually want? Why do we want to rehearse it at all? What do we, what do we want to know? In the 19th century, Kierkegaard <coughs> wrote that there was a secret note uh, in everyone's life a secret note that could explain everything. Mm. Kierkegaard said that there was such a note in his own life, but he wasn't going to reveal it. He was going to keep it from the world, keep it a secret. Uh, people have speculated ardently about Shakespeare, <coughs> uh, about what the secret note was. Hidden Catholicism, homosexuality, uh, or the great secret note of all, somebody else wrote the works. Uh, that's, that's the supreme secret note. I'm skeptical about <coughs> the whole idea of a secret note in a life and in a career such as Shakespeare's, but that does seem to me a mystery to be solved. How do you get from a provincial middle class young man without a university education, without a patronage network, a noble patron willing to support you, how do you get from such a figure uh, to the staggering achievements uh, of his uh, remarkable career? Solving that mystery, if we ever could do it, <coughs> would not make the wonder of Shakespeare's achievement evaporate. It could only intensify that wonder by connecting his remarkable genius with a flesh and blood person who lived in the world and who grappled with the problems that ordinary human beings confront uh, in their life. <coughs> you can, of course, in the face of, of staggering talent, in the face of, of Bach, or, or now I can't really uh, uh, say this, how do you say it, uh, I, We would say Bruegel. Uh, you can throw up your hands in pious incomprehension, and you can tell yourself that the artist was a god, or what amounts to the same thing, the artist was in league with the devil. Uh, but more plausibly, you can and you should throw yourself into pleasurable contemplation uh, to try to get an enhanced understanding of technique, uh, hyperbole, unusual alternations of poetry and prose, or Shakespeare's uh, favorite rhetorical technique, a weird one, uh, Hendiades, which he loved, uh, that strange technique of separating certain words, malignant and a turbaned Turk. Uh, as Othello says, well, he's not two different Turks there. There's a, he's a malignant one who's wearing a turban, but Shakespeare writes that's a, a sort of strange Lombroso-like signature on Shakespeare's part. You can always see it's Shakespeare writing if he, do, if he puts in an, what looks like an unnecessary Hendiades. 
But we want more than technical notation. We want to know about the creator as a human being. We want to take human possession, as it were, uh, of the creation. We want to observe the creator <coughs> in his world. But it's not easy in the case of Shakespeare. <coughs> about 10 years ago, I <coughs> had a call. I was teaching at Berk University of California at Berkeley, and I had a call <coughs> from a Hollywood screenwriter named Mark Norman. <coughs> He identified himself as the screenwriter for several movies that I might have known, Sword of the Ninja, Bat 21, Cutthroat Island. I had to admit that I hadn't seen these yet. Uh, <clears throat> these said he wanted to take me to lunch in Berkeley, which he did, uh, and told me that he was planning to write a screenplay for a movie that was going to be based on Amadeus. <clears throat> the movie bi biographical picture that you must have seen, many of you, <coughs> about Mozart. <coughs> he wanted to write it about Shakespeare. It was going to be an Amadeus-like effect. And he wanted my suggestions as to what pieces of Shakespeare's life he should put into this account. And I said, forget it. Uh, there's nothing in Shakespeare's life that would be worthy of a film. Uh, it's hopeless. It's just tax records, th the list that uh, you gave. Uh, a few bureaucratic records, he didn't like to pay taxes very much, uh, birth, uh, christening record, <coughs> death records, a uh, rather sour last will and testament, <coughs> a few other things, nothing worth uh, a movie. I said, make a movie about Shakespeare's contemporary Marlowe, that's a great life. Uh, the man was a double agent or a triple agent, uh, he was a homosexual in a homophobic world, uh, a fantastic a uh, risk taker, a violent man. <clears throat> uh, he ended up with a knife stuck in his eye. Uh, what more could you want? This is a fantastic life. Uh, the great, great writer. He said, no, no, it had to be, it definitely had to be about Shakespeare. Uh, so I said, all right. He actually came back a second time and I thought more and I, uh, took me to, to another lunch. I said, how about have Shakespeare have an affair with Marlowe? Uh, Shakespeare has a sort of complicated bisexual life, as far as we can tell. If you, then you can get Marlowe's life in. It's a great life, a double agent. He ends up with a knife in his eye and so forth. He said, forget it. <clears throat> he was trying to get money from, he was planning to get money from the Disney Corporation, and they wouldn't put up with any <clears throat> of this. So <clears throat> I wasn't much more help than that, and I forgot about it. And then, uh, not so many years later, Mark Norman, uh, with the help of Tom Stoppard, uh, wrote the screenplay for a, a film called Shakespeare in Love that some of you at least may have seen that uh, was a very uh, enormously successful and also fantastically entertaining film. <coughs> and I hope I'm not disappointing you if I tell you that the film is not actually historically accurate. Uh, but it engaged its, its to my astonishment, the film engaged its audience, a mass audience, uh, with a fundamentally literary question. The question of how Shakespeare got from being the very talented journeyman author of The Two Gentlemen of Verona, who, the, 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 the lines that are quoted at the beginning of the play, how did he get from that person to being the person who wrote Romeo and Juliet? And the intuition that the film had, which is its own intuition and very much chiming with a popular intuition, vulgar popular intuition, is that it can't only have been the work that Shakespeare did in his study. Uh, it had to be something in Shakespeare's life in relation to the world, the thing that the movie calls Gwyneth Paltrow. Now, it happens that Gwyneth Paltrow, as far as we know, is not a significant figure in Shakespeare's life or any such equivalent. But the intuition, uh, which as I say is a uh, popular intuition, seems to me fundamentally true from a scholarly point of view. Well, not from, maybe not from a scholarly point of view in the sense that I have clear evidence this, for this, but from everything that in the course of my lifetime I think I understand about how art is created. I think it can't only have been 
the fact that Shakespeare was a very assiduous reader of other people's books, but that something about his relationship to the world, about his way of being in the world, about the way he responded to the people he encountered, about the way he absorbed the forces of, of his life, about his openness uh, to his existence as it was given to him, thrown as he was into a particular time and place, that that must be able to help us explain how he got from two gentlemen to Romeo and Juliet, from Romeo and Juliet to Hamlet, and from Hamlet to King Lear, and from King Lear to the Tempest, and so forth. <coughs> it's this vital link between life and work that I've sought to reconstruct to the best of my ability <coughs> in Will and the World. I'm, by the way, touched and uh, amused that if I understand some of the linguistic reasons, but that my somewhat cheeky Will, uh, calling him Will, which is what he called himself, uh, has been slightly formalized into William uh, in the Dutch uh, translation, which I understand prevents the absurd confusion which has already occurred that this is somehow a book about Schopenhauer uh, and not about uh, Shakespeare. <coughs> what are some of these uh, links? When Shakespeare was 13, his father, John, <coughs> lost most of his money and social position and did what Elizabethan adults hated to do, which was to mortgage property. They hated it more than the death of children. They couldn't stand this idea. When Shakespeare was 16, he left school <coughs> and seems to have been sent to work uh, as a school teacher, possibly in a Catholic household <coughs> in the North. There is a tissue of evidence, but very tricky, elusive evidence, but I believe it is accumulatively forceful that suggests that Shakespeare has this kind of Catholic connection from his late teens. <coughs> when Shakespeare was 18, he married the 26-year-old Anne Hathaway, who was already pregnant <coughs> with their first child, uh, to whom she gave birth six months later. That is to say, by the time Shakespeare was 18, he was already grappling with a set of questions that life gives you. What should I do with my life? There is no glove business to go into, if there ever would have been an attractive role for Shakespeare in the glove business. There's actually a, a very strange thing that survives from very, very early, but not quite from Shakespeare's lifetime, but in a commonplace book, you know, the books that the people in the early modern period used to keep to jot down little things that come their way. <coughs> in a 17th century commonplace book, <coughs> there's a reference to some verses on a pair of gloves given by Master Aspinall uh, to the woman he was courting. Master Aspinall was, a, uh, was the man who was hired <coughs> to be uh, the vicar in Stratford during Shakespeare's lifetime. Shakespeare was young. And the verses go, uh, the gift is small, the will is all, Alexander Aspinall. Uh, and the person who wrote that in his commonplace book wrote uh, verses on a pair of gloves bought by Master Aspinall written by Mr. Shakespeare. So uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not, probably we're getting a glimpse of the life Shakespeare could have had writing jingles uh, for the father's glove business uh, if it hadn't hit upon hard times. All right, what shall I do with my life? What is my vocation? And in what can I have faith? What can I believe in? What, are, is there anything out there on which to stake the beliefs of my life? And whom do I love? Those questions are all there, as I say, in place by the time Shakespeare was 18, and they're the questions with which he grapples uh, throughout his career, never quite solving any of them except the first. Uh, what is my vocation? What shall I do? What I try to do in the book, in the absence of, uh, of the things that one would, of course, love to have, the diaries and the journals, uh, the, all of the wonderful uh, biographical traces that one would, of course, adore having from Shakespeare, in the absence of those, <coughs> I try basically four different things, each of which has its uh, problems from an evidentiary point of view, I understand, and we can talk about what those problems are. 
But in the first place, I look very, very carefully at recurrent patterns in his work. Because what matters finally, centrally, is the work. I'm not trying to take the work and strip it away and find the life that's underneath it and forget about the work. What matters is the work. So I start and end, in some sense, from grappling with the work. And one thing I think about a lot are apparently obsessive concerns, <coughs> such as the recurrent Shakespearean fantasy of a shipwreck and a restoration, some terrible loss of place, identity, name, and then the dream of getting it back. <coughs> it's Viola and Sebastian and Twelfth Night. It's Orlando and As You Like It who says, I should have been brought up as a gentleman. I should have been given an education. And here I am being brought up as a boor, uh, as a peasant. It's Marina and Pericles. It's Inogen and Posthumus. And virtually all the other characters in Cymbeline. It's Prospero, Miranda and the Tempest. It's many, many, many other characters in Shakespeare have this recurrent pattern of terrible loss, centrally on a loss of identity and name, and then a restoration. And I try to think about that pattern of the dream of, that dream of loss and restoration in relation to a set of acts in Shakespeare's life. Shakespeare's father, just before whatever happened, we don't know exactly, that precipitated the father's loss of position. The father was the equivalent of mayor of Stratford. And then when Shakespeare was about 13, as I said, the father not only mortgages his property, he stops attending council meetings. He becomes a non-public person. He's actually, there's a record of him hiding in his house for fear of arrest for debt. But just before this shipwreck hit the family, <coughs> Shakespeare's father had applied for a coat of arms <coughs> about 1586. He had filed the application. <coughs> you couldn't just buy a coat of arms <coughs> in the period. Uh, you had to qualify for it, but Shakespeare's father, though he was from a yeoman farming family, could have done so because he had been an important civic official. As important and prosperous civic official, uh, he had the, the standing in the community to pass from the 98% of the population that was non-gentry <coughs> into the 2% of the population that was gentry. That was a huge move in this period. It meant an enormous change in social status. Shakespeare's father, John, apparently wanted it. He filed this application. But though you couldn't buy it, I occasionally get, I don't know if this happens in Holland, but I haven't got it recently, but I used to get letters in any case from companies that offered to sell me the ancient and honorable Greenblatt coat of arms, you can imagine. <laughs> uh, I've never really responded to these. Uh, in any case, it cost something, quite a lot of money, actually. <clears throat> and in the wake of the shipwreck of the family fortunes, Shakespeare's father evidently couldn't follow up on the application. But a decade later, somebody renewed the application. The somebody was certainly not Shakespeare's uh, haberdasher brother, Gilbert, the non-entity brother Richard, the poor actor Edmund, the impoverished sister Joan. Uh, it was unquestionably William Shakespeare who was prospering at that point in the latter 1590s in London. <coughs> William Shakespeare goes and revives the family application for the coat of arms, puts up the money for it, and writes a motto, non sans droit. Uh, <clears throat> the clerk who wrote the motto down was like a Shakespearean clown, in any case a skeptic, <clears throat> because he wrote non, comma, sans droit. Uh, and then sh someone, presumably Shakespeare, said, all right, wise guy, lose the comma. Uh, do it again, and he wrote a second time, non, comma, sans droit, and the second time it's crossed out, and finally gets it right, non, sans droit. A little defensive, the motto, and with good reason, because uh, two years later, Shakespeare's colleague, Ben Johnson, uh, writes a play for the company that Shakespeare and Ben Johnson both are writing for, Lord Chamberlain's Men, in which a p particularly vulgar character named Soliardo uh, decides he wants to buy a coat of arms for himself, and he spends a lot of money, he's an incredible buffoon, and he's given the motto, not without mustard. Uh, Shakespeare had to watch that over and over again, uh, deal with that kind of mockery, and there was more to it as well, but it was worth it for him. The coat of arms, the dream of passing into this 
uh, status of gentleman as he wrote himself gentleman uh, was something worth uh, accepting considerable humiliation as well as expending uh, considerable money. But he also is the author who created Malvolio. In some sense, his greatest and also cruelest comic plot is about someone who dreams of being a gentleman, of rising above his station, and is ruthlessly humiliated. Shakespeare also understood very deeply from the inside uh, that situation. Okay, I said, I won't go on in this vein, but I said I'm interested in recurrences. <coughs> I'm also interested, perhaps even more problematically, <coughs> in things that aren't there. Now, I concede that there are many things that aren't there. There's nothing about stem cell research and Shakespeare's work and so forth and so on. But I'm talking about things that are there that could have been there. This is someone who left almost nothing out from the life that he lived, from the life that were lived around him. He seizes upon everything. He seems to have had five, six, seven, eight lives because so much gets into his work. But though he lived in a world touched intimately by sainthood, by people willing to stake their lives and their souls on their beliefs, the saint is the kind of character that Shakespeare keeps a very great distance from. Joan of Arc in Henry VI plays is a whore uh, and in also league with the devil. Uh, Henry the sixth, the saintly king is an idiot and an incompetent. Um, Isabella in the uh, saintly nun uh, in Measure for Measure is willing to see her brother die uh, to protect her virginity, a view that is regarded with considerable skepticism uh, in the play, and so forth and so on. These are figures about whom Shakespeare feels uh, enormous at the very least ambivalence, uh, shading most frequently into active distaste. Or likewise, <clears throat> this person who was married for 34 years, um, and as I say, used everything that came his way, has uh, almost no representations of marital intimacy in his work. He has representations of marriages but the marriages are almost always marked by some forms of estrangement between husband and wife when they're marked at all. Shakespeare's happiest forms of marriages are marriages in which the woman is dead. Uh, there's an amazing list of missing mothers uh, in Shakespeare's play, but when he actually does occasionally represent mothers uh, who are alive with their husbands as well, I mean, they're occasional monstrous mothers like Volumnia, but she doesn't have a husband. Mm -hmm. um, when he occasionally represents husbands and wives, they usually in situations of deep uh, estrangement. There are only two exceptions, as far as I can tell, of two moments in which Shakespeare represents active marital intimacy, what it means to share a life together. And they are telling in their exceptional nature. One is Gertrude and Claudius uh, in Hamlet, who seem to have a genuinely good marriage. <coughs> and the other, Macbeth's. Uh, who also have in their weird way uh, a, a good marriage in the sense that they call each other nicknames, dearest Chuck and so forth. They plan little treats for each other, murders that they're uh, going to commit or this or that. Uh, they, they seem to live to inhabit each other's minds in that special way in which people who've lived together for a long time can actually take each other in, inhabit the other and so forth. But I take it that the, that the combination of the absences plus these weird equivocal presences is also telling us something about Shakespeare's life as well as his reading. <clears throat> I talk somewhat more plausibly about presences as well in the work, things that have left their fingerprints on Shakespeare's work. Uh, it's sometimes said about Shakespeare that he was such a sovereign genius that he had no anxiety about rivals, no anxiety of influence. I don't think this is true. I think that he is actually deeply anxious, not only at the beginning, but really in some sense all through his lifetime, about Christopher Marlowe, his most talented uh, contemporary. Um, and it's not only talented contemporaries who register in Shakespeare's mind, it's also <coughs> uh, less talented contemporaries. Not actually the ones that we think of, I mean, are not, the, not the great geniuses that we think of, not Bacon or Spencer, but a figure like <coughs> Lodge or Nash uh, 
uh, or Green, Robert Green, the scoundrel, mm. uh, bohemian scoundrel that Shakespeare encountered when he first came up to London, a sort of wild, uh, dissolute man but with degrees, university degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge, who cultivated his hair into a very long point, a long point of red hair, and he used to hang a pearl from the end of the <laughs> hank of hair that he had. <coughs> and uh, he died young in his early 30s, and as he was dying, <coughs> either he or, it's quite possible he was the kind of person who would actually try to make a little money on his deathbed, but either he or someone with him <coughs> uh, wrote a famous uh, insult to Shakespeare as an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, who thinks he's the only shake scene in the country. Uh, those lines stuck in Shakespeare's craw. Uh, he registered them. So, well, how did we know he registered them? Because uh, years later, long after Green, even in his enormous bulk, had molded into dust in the grave, Shakespeare has in in uh, Hamlet, <coughs> Polonius read an intercepted letter from Hamlet to, uh, to uh, Polonius' daughter Ophelia, in which Hamlet is writing to the most celestial and beautified Ophelia. And Polonius looks up and says, beautified? Oh, that's a vile phrase, beautified. Now, that's back to Green's saying, the upstart crow, beautified with our feathers. It's still rankling <coughs> seven, eight, nine years later, whatever it was, in Shakespeare's head. But there's more than that, because at least so I argue, <coughs> Shakespeare takes Green and uses him and many other things, but uses Green as the core of his greatest comic creation, uh, car camera ca comic character, Falstaff. Mm. All right, <coughs> recurrences and absences and presences and finally, <coughs> I have shamelessly uh, a very long series of imaginings. A first glimpse of Shakespeare, first glimpsing what play acting is, standing between his father's legs. In each case, based on something, some piece of contextual evidence that we have. <coughs> or Shakespeare, in one of those school plays of which we have records where they used to put on Plautus and Terence. Shakespeare playing the part in which he kisses uh, a boy actor playing the girl, or Shakespeare possibly meeting and confessing to Campion, the Catholic saint in the north, or Shakespeare encountering the heads of his own kinsmen, uh, Arden and Somerville on London Bridge, or Shakespeare standing at the foot of the scaffold when the Queen's physician Rodrigo Lopez was executed, and hearing a current of horrible crowd laughter, and using that laughter to create Merchant of Venice, or Shakespeare watching the king, King James, responding uh, to the spectacle of witches, and so forth. <coughs> I will, I could take more time, all the time you want, uh, on this, but I won't. I won't allow myself to do it. I'll just actually close <coughs> by uh, reading you a tiny piece of the book, <coughs> just to give you uh, uh, some of its flavor. <coughs> it is often a source of complaint with, after all, not unreasonable complaint, that Shakespeare disappoints everyone by <coughs> having such a depressing, in the sense of conventional and boring end of his life, no knife through his eye, uh, no starving to death in a garret. He buys a very fancy house, the second best house in Stratford, and buys a bunch of annuities, uh, or what we would call annuities, and he returns to the place that he came from, and he lives as a, uh, fat cheek burger, uh, actually rather short, for a rather short period of time. I think he probably expected to live longer. But he returns uh, to uh, that place. And it's always been a source of embarrassment. Uh, and I have to deal with it the way anyone who writes about, Shakespeare has to, about Shakespeare's life has to deal with it. So here's my dealing with it. <coughs> <coughs> He who would imagine the lives of kings and rebels, <coughs> Roman emperors and black warriors. He who would fashion a place for himself in the wild world of the London stage would embrace ordinariness. <coughs> Shakespeare would enact a final fantastic theatrical experiment. <coughs> 
the everyday life of a country gentleman, the role he'd been slowly constructing for years through the purchase of the coat of arms, the investments, the decision to keep his family back in Stratford, <coughs> the careful maintenance of old social networks. Why would he have done such a thing? In part, perhaps, because of a lingering sense of lack. Shakespeare began his life with questions about his faith, his love, and his social role. <coughs> he had never found anything equivalent to the faith on which some of his contemporaries had staked their lives. If he himself had once been drawn towards such a commitment, he had turned away from it many years before. <coughs> to be sure, he had infused his theatrical vision with the vital remnants of that faith, but he never lost sight of the unreality of the stage <coughs> and never pretended that his literary visions could simply substitute for the beliefs that led Catholic missionaries like Campion and others to their deaths. And though he may have had brief glimpses of bliss in his life, one certainly hopes so, he had never found the love of which he wrote and dreamt so powerfully. From the perspective of this sense of lack, a skeptical intimation of hollowness in faith and in love. This is the writer who wrote, when my love says she's made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. <clears throat> His performance of the role of an ordinary gentleman might be seen as a crucial achievement. <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice. <clears throat> but the embrace of the everyday is surely not only a question of lack <clears throat> and compensation. It's a question of the nature of his whole magnificent achievement. <clears throat> Throughout his career, Shakespeare was fascinated by exotic locations, by archaic cultures, and larger-than-life figures. But his imagination was closely bound to the familiar and the everyday and the intimate. Or rather, he loved to reveal the presence of ordinariness in the midst of the extraordinary. <clears throat> Shakespeare's been criticized from time to time for this quality. <clears throat> Pedants have sourly observed that his toga-wearing Romans throw up their hats in the air as if they're London workmen. Critics concerned with decorum have complained that a handkerchief, something you blow your nose in, is far too vulgar an object to be mentioned, let alone serve as the center uh, of a tragedy. And at least one great writer, <clears throat> Tolstoy, thought that an aged King Lear who walks about raving wildly was an appropriate object, not of awe, but of moral revulsion and aesthetic contempt. <coughs> Excuse me for one second, I'm just gonna take my, another sip of water, see if I can keep this going for another two minutes. Mm. It's true. Shakespeare's imagination never soared altogether above the quotidian, never entered the august halls of the metaphysical and shut the door to the everyday. <clears throat> in Venus and Adonis, we see the sweat on the face of the goddess of love. In Romeo and Juliet, while the grieving parents weep over Juliet's lifeless body, the musicians who've been hired for the wedding quietly joke with each other while they put away their instruments, and then they decide to linger for the funeral dinner in Antony and Cleopatra, the same observer who has the famous description of Cleopatra on her barge also paints a very different picture. I saw her once hop 40 paces through the public street. He made a decision early in his life, or perhaps a decision was made for him. <clears throat> he had something amazing in him, but it would not be the gift of the demiurge. <clears throat> Rather, it would be something that would not altogether ever lose its local roots. There is a letter that was written by Machiavelli <clears throat> shortly after he had lost his position in Florence and had been forcibly rusticated. <clears throat> he writes with disgust of the vulgar arguments and stupid games he was forced to watch at the local tavern. His only relief came in the evenings when he could put off the clothes sullied by the banalities of the daylight hours. <clears throat> Dressed in a rich gown, he would take down from his shelves his beloved authors, <coughs> Cicero, Livy, Tacitus, and feel that at last he had a companion fit for his intellect. Nothing could be further from Shakespeare's sensibility. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> he never showed signs of boredom, at the small talk, the trivial pursuits, and the foolish games of ordinary people. <clears throat> the highest act of his magician Prospero is to give up his magical powers and return to the place from which he had come. Perhaps Shakespeare was drawn home by something else, <clears throat> a motive that unlike all the others in his very private life, seems to lie in plain sight. <clears throat> Everyone has noticed the terrible slight in his, will, in his will to his wife, Anne. This is the, Shakespeare left nothing to his wife in the first, uh, of 34 years in the first draft of the will, and then no doubt prodded by someone, he left her his second best bed. <clears throat> Everyone has noticed the slight to his daughter, Judith, and to her husband, they're left almost nothing. <clears throat> but that will is also, in its quiet way, a remarkable declaration of love, a declaration that may help to explain what drew him back to Stratford. The woman who most intensely appealed to Shakespeare in his life was the woman to whom he left everything, virtually everything, that he had graspingly accumulated in his life. A woman 20 years younger than he, his daughter, Susanna. It cannot be an accident that three of his last plays, Pericles, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest, are centered on the father-daughter relationship and are so deeply anxious about incestuous desires. <clears throat> what Shakespeare wanted was only what he could actually have in the most ordinary and natural way, the pleasure of living near his daughter and her husband and their young child, Elizabeth. He understood that this pleasure had a strange, slightly melancholy dimension, a joy intimately braided together with renunciation. That is the burden of those last plays. <clears throat> but it is a strangeness that hides within the boundaries of the everyday. And that is where he was determined to end his days. I'm sorry, my voice has now ended, so I'll stop for a minute. <clears throat> Now we will break for a little while and we'll continue at 9.15 if, if you're okay. And then we'll have an interview on this little table. Safely reopen the proceedings. Uh, we will have a, uh, an interview and then uh, take some questions from the floor. Well, uh, let me first say that I said you, you were a gifted writer, but you are a gifted performer as well. And in these surroundings, uh, it, it, it did ring a bell. Um, I have, besides immense admiration for the book, uh, some questions which I'd like to put to you. And um, uh, the first of these is, uh, um, the one that uh, has to do with the um, dream of restoration. You quote abundantly from, from the uh, works of Shakespeare, which is a great pleasure, and these quotes are then submitted to admirable biographical scrutiny with offhand but acute literary comments, by the way. But what you never do in, in, uh, uh, when you quote is speak about literary sources of these quotations. You quote the death of Falstaff without saying what you know, namely that it's a parody of Plato's description of the death of Socrates. You analyze a remark from As You Like It about flocks for sale without saying that this happens often in, often in Virgil's Eglogues. You interpret Lady Macbeth's reassurance of her guests intimidated by the behavior of her husband without saying that it is a parody of a famous scene from Tacitus' Annales. Or more broadly, you interpret the theme of restoration and the theme of shipwreck biographically, while it is a, topic, a topical uh, thing, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, theme of uh, restoration is topical in ancient comedies and the ancient novel. Even in epic, the great uh, Virgil start with, with the shipwreck uh, and allergy with Ovid. I, I would say Shakespeare couldn't have written comedy without restoration, for there is no comedy without restoration. And I, I would argue that Shakespeare knew these texts intimately. And my question thus is, 
why do you so heavily downplay the influence of liter literary tradition on Shakespeare? Well, I'm, <coughs> I have to, <coughs> sorry, I have to plead guilty that you're right, of course. <coughs> I have spent much of my career <coughs> the way most Shakespeare <coughs> scholars spend their careers analyzing Shakespeare's sources, so I'm not unfamiliar with uh, the idea of, yeah. of uh, looking hard at what he was <coughs> reading, what he was able to read, and thinking about how he used it. And if the book had been <coughs> two or three times as long uh, as it already is rather long, <coughs> I perhaps would have done, probably would have tried to do <coughs> more of this. But I was taking for granted the fact that <coughs> uh, a long history of Shakespeare scholarship <coughs> has emphasized the reading that Shakespeare did and what he was able to do with his sources. But I was also, perhaps more saliently to your question, assuming something about conventions and sources, which I suppose is a debatable question. I'm assuming that the sources that are available to Shakespeare, to John Marlowe, at the level that they're operating, <coughs> were available to everyone. That writers choose their, the, the, the things that they resonate with. And that the fact that you can identify something in a literary source doesn't strip away its uh, inner human meaning. Uh, ben Jonson also wrote comedies in this period, as did <coughs> many other writers, including Green and Peele. Those comedies, in fact, don't sound remotely like Shakespeare's, and they actually are not recurrently drawn to the same account. Uh, Volponi is, you could, you could make an argument in which very, very broadly, grosso modo, uh, there is some alienation in return in Volponi and uh, the alchemist, but it doesn't even res begin to resemble that loss and recovery of identity that is the current Shakespearean theme, even though you're absolutely right, of course, you could uh, cite many sources for it. In the book of Siegel, mm. uh, the, the death of comedy, it, mm. is, it is the <coughs> main theme of comedy, but of course, Siegel knew Shakespeare, so. Yes, <laughs> yes. May, but but it, it, it is evident from the ancient sources. It, it, yes. It, it no, no, of course you're right. The question is, a default I mean, assumption. The question, in a way, between between us, or the interesting question, perhaps for a larger audience, is what's the. <coughs> once you have identified a literary source, have you, therefore, uh, excluded a biographical trace by virtue of it being yeah. part of a long-term uh, public tradition? And I would say, no. Any more than when I speak intimately to the people I love, to my wife, to my children. At the most uh, uh, stringent moments of self-revelation, I find myself, if I stand back from myself, speaking in highly conventional language uh, that has literary analogs and sources, uh, actually much less exalted, <coughs> mostly than the ones you've cited, yeah. movies that I've seen, or yeah. love poems yeah. I've read well, at some point so. or other. I quite agree. Uh, so that's all I'm, for the purposes of this book, yeah. I bracketed the... But then it's the resonance, the resonance of the theme which, <coughs> which, which triggers your interpretation. Yes. And <coughs> well, in this, uh, in this context, there uh, uh, is another question and, um, uh, concerning <coughs> books. Uh, your biographical predecessor, Park Honan, spoke of Shakespeare, and uh, this is a Dutch term. I, I, I don't remember the word loud, but uh, someone always busy reading. And now there's Lucas Earn. And now there's Lucas Earn, uh, who has argued that Shakespeare was consciously trying to become an author and a literary dramatist, as he calls it. And you repeatedly state uh, that Shakespeare was not interested in publication, and neither were the companies uh, for which he uh, worked. What do you think of uh, Earn's book and its thesis? And is, it, is this thesis of a literary Shakespeare consciously trying to become a, a book, let's say, Shakespeare, uh, with inverted commas, is it compatible with your view? Um, only roughly. <coughs> I think that <coughs> I admire Lucas Earn's book, which I see you have here. <coughs> it, Lucas Earn's book argues that, <coughs> that despite a tradition of saying that Shakespeare was indifferent to, the, uh, to his that there is much evidence of Shakespeare <coughs> carefully reworking, working and reworking his texts. <coughs> so that they <coughs> could have independent literary stamp. 
about half of Shakespeare's plays were published in his own lifetime <clears throat> uh, in the form of quartos. <clears throat> so we, it's not as if he wouldn't have seen any of his plays in print. But if he were set on being a literary playwright <clears throat> whose works the sub would survive as texts for readers, startlingly incompetent uh, writer. And nothing in his professional life suggests incompetence. His professional life suggests astonishing confidence and competence. <clears throat> so that it, I entirely believe that Shakespeare <clears throat> was a literary dramatist in the sense that he took the literary force and merits of his work seriously. But it's not at all clear to me that he actually committed himself in a serious way to the literary survival in the sense of the textual printed survival of his works. But you yourself mm. have stressed uh, the theme of the first of 17 sonnets as, uh, uh, in mm. fact, uh, 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 one large uh, theme of immortalization by literature. Well, the 70, first 70 sonnets is immortalization <coughs> by pride. In fact, uh, 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 one large uh, theme of immortalization by literature. Well, the 70, first 70 sonnets is immortalization <coughs> by progeny, by having children. But <coughs> slowly, slowly turning <coughs> towards, and it is even, I, that was what, what I'd like to put to you, is it possible to read these first sonnets as, as uh, not uh, concerning pro uh, progeny, but uh, literary progeny? It's certainly the case that the sonnets make a very strong claim, not the first 17, but the, but the sonnets to the young man as a whole make an extremely strong claim. In fact, replace the idea of your biological progeny as <clears throat> that which will carry you into the future with the idea of these verses as what will carry you into the future. <clears throat> But these verses have no clear relation to printed verses. The Shakespeare may have felt very deeply that his survival as a poet as well as as a literary dramatist didn't depend on print. It depended on a combination of a long performance tradition, which I think he anticipated, and in the case of the sonnets, manuscript circulation. So that there's no, in other words, the link that you imply that being a literary dramatist means being determined to appear in a stable text in print it seems to me a dubious one. But if we mean by a literary dramatist someone who took writing seriously and thought that the texts would in various forms survive as works of literature, that seems to me indubitably true. So I want to have it both ways. I think that, that in the case of the sonnets, what's weird about the sonnets is the sonnets say repeatedly that, that you will be known forever through my verses. But no one knows who the sonnets were written for. Uh, that's weird. Uh, and it can't be an that's accident. That's platonic, I think. There's it's a lot platonic. of these things. It's, oh, it's you're it's tremendously kind. You have a uh, splendid doctor here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're really kind. Um, another point. You repeatedly stress the importance of the disappearance of, of Catholic ritual the importance for the development of theater in Britain. And uh, it, bec it becoming a sort of ersatz, ersatz, the theater becoming a sort of ersatz for the ritual. And that is one of your main theses. Uh, but at <coughs> exactly the same time, in the uh, first <coughs> decade of the 17th century, in the epicenter of Catholicism in Rome, you see uh, a development in the paintings of Caravaggio, uh, uh, particularly, which has just this same uh, intensification of drama, of characterization, of the, the, something is happening there which, to my mind, is very comparable, similar to, to what, what is, is happening in Shakespeare's theater. And uh, then again, the, the, the development of the theater in the early 17th century is in Spain, in Catholic Spain, and uh, uh, also in Italy. Giannini was a, was a famed uh, theater man and we have not got the texts, not all of the texts, or we haven't got them edited, but they are there, I think. How is that, is that <coughs> compatible? I mean, is, is because when the Catholics are, are, are dramatizing just as much as, as <coughs> Protestant London is, 
Well, no one ever doubted that the Catholic Church had a deep and intimate relation to theatricality. <clears throat> so that's not in question. Of the two figures that you cite, Caravaggio and, and Bernini, I would have said one was too far to the left and the other was too far to the right, if those are <laughs> uh, the, <clears throat> the right topographical descriptions. That is to say, I see, in some sense, what you mean about Caravaggio, particularly. When Caravaggio does a holy family and it turns out to look uncannily like a family standing on a Neapolitan doorstep, uh, or when a saint is depicted with, a dead saint is depicted with, with um, dirt between her toes, uh, you feel that there is a, a, a virtually violent relation to what I'm calling the everyday. But it is violent in a way that I think Shakespeare's relation to the everyday rarely is. That is to say, I see Caravaggio's theatrical absorption of Catholicism as, uh, if that's an appropriate way of describing it, um, as much more transgressive uh, than uh, Shakespeare's. I see Bernini, the Cornaro Chapel, or um, uh, the Baldacchino as, as um, how should we say, much more within uh, the ritual orbit of the yeah. Catholic faith. Yeah, it, you uh, might very well be right, but I, I thought it, 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 it's a strange mm. point that this Catholicism in your book is very important. Yes. And, mm. um, but, but Catholicism itself is, is moving uh, in, the, in these. Uh, the, issue is not <coughs> the issue is not that <coughs> Shakespeare uh, does something as a <coughs> Protestant <coughs> with Catholic tradition that it's inconceivable that a Catholic do, <coughs> but that he used within the resources of his world something that looks like it had been thrown out, damaged, outlawed, mm -hmm. that he's able to rummage around in institutionally damaged goods and find something that is reaching large numbers of people in a deep, inward way <coughs> that we might not have expected. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um. Leonardo da Vinci is credited with the dictum, <coughs> ogni pittore dipinge se, or, or uh, every painter paints himself. Have you experienced in your writing of the book a certain affinity with your subject? <coughs> I'm in love with a woman who's <coughs> actually more than 20 years younger than me. Uh, so if that is a form of, biographic, of autobiographical projection, <coughs> then I uh, acknowledge one. <coughs> a life is anyone's life chimes with every other life. That's the <clears throat> fundamental realization that Montaigne had. I'm no uh, French late 16th century gentleman, but I feel the deepest inner affinity and association with Montaigne. So it means that already without any biographical projection, but just by virtue of being a human being, I am already connected in an intimate way with someone who bears no apparent relation to me socially or uh, God knows I wish intellectually. Uh, and something like that must be true with Shakespeare. Of course I see myself all over this book, but I hope I see myself all over the book not by virtue of uh, autobiographical projection onto Shakespeare's life, but by virtue of burrowing down, as I hope I've done, to the kind of groundwater that uh, runs in a life that connects that life with other lives, uh, mine and yours and everyone here. But without, but I mean burrowing down and not rising up, not, not leaving the earth behind, not finding a sort of transcendent sphere of affinity, but understanding that there are things in the physical necessities of life and the uh, associations of life that everyone decisions that everyone makes, that Shakespeare knew about, that was in touch with, it's why we care about the work still, uh, and that speak to us now, and, th and that in which my life is intimately involved. I sense a strong emotion, actually, in your uh, writing and in, and in your talking as well. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is Shakespeare a way for you to uh, 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 get to emotions, or uh, mm -hmm. has, it, uh, has it an emotional release? What, what, because I, 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 I have the same, <laughs> I don't know the same, but I have this mm. myself. It, it brings a sort of release. Shakespeare is the <clears throat> one of the great poets of the passions in the literature of the world. 
he's intellectually <clears throat> gripping as well, but he is deeply, uh, astonishingly deeply engaged with fundamental human passions. <clears throat> so if you have any capacity for a passionate life yourself, it has to be engaged uh, by, by Shakespeare. It's also probably the case that the force of Shakespeare's work is to break the emotional defenses that in an ordinary life we construct for ourselves. So at least at those moments, one feels, as you say, some form of release. And it's also the case that in, particularly in writing this kind of book, I felt um, disinclined to be defensive. Otherwise I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have done it, I wouldn't be sitting here. Because uh, I would have been afraid I'd be making too much of a fool of myself. That is to say, you can't write this book without uh, an act of, of uh, tightrope walking and self-exposure. And mm, so be it. Um, the, otherwise you, well, it's not that you can't write such a book, but there are innumerable biographies of Shakespeare. And there are marvelous ones, one of which you cited, Park Honan's splendid life of Shakespeare. So, uh, or Samuel Schoenbaum's documentary, Life of Shakespeare. These are marvelous books, and they're books, I think, in which the self of the writer is kept further back, of the, of the biographer is kept further back, further in the shadows. Not that it isn't there, but it's, it's kept less, it's less exposed. But the trouble with those books, and I have learned enormously from them, and I respect them, and I care about them, is that, and the reason that there was room, or at least I felt there was room to write the book that I wrote, is that the books are very, very detached from any uh, passionate life in the writer himself. They're very standoffish. And I decided I would try this. And that's the charm. That's the, one, of the, one of the charms of the book. Um, I have a technical, perhaps too technical, but we'll see uh, <laughs> a thing. And uh, that is that you seem uncharacteristically timid in your interpretation of the winter's tale, uh, um, taking your line of investigation in this late play written immediately before retirement. Uh, you would think there was a, a, a hint that Shakespeare had high hopes for revival of his <laughs> marriage, but you resist this. Why? Well, maybe he did have, <coughs> have <coughs> fantastic hopes. Because it is true that Shakespeare repeatedly, what's strange about Shakespeare, because he seems like he, how shall we say, he probably wasn't the best husband in the world, to put it mildly. <clears throat> and what's odd about that is that there's almost no um, sanctimoniousness or self-pity in the works that way. On the contrary, the works repeatedly depict women who've been wronged by their husbands. <clears throat> uh, who've been mistreated, who, uh, whose husbands have not shared their lives with them, or in the case of The Winter's Tale, who have horrendously abused and wronged them. <clears throat> it's possible uh, that Shakespeare felt some form of burden of guilt of this kind, and some dream that <clears throat> he would uh, go back and make things up after so many years an even longer gap of years than he's imagining uh, in The Winter's Tale. Why I didn't uh, speculate of this kind uh, uh, in, in this vein, it would have been possible, it's true, because shortly thereafter Shakespeare was going home, was perhaps because I was focused maybe more sharply than I should have been on the way in which I think Shakespeare is present in two different characters in The Winter's Tale, <clears throat> not in Leontes, <clears throat> Not in the relationship between Leontes and Hermione, but in the witchy, in the witch-like Paulina, <clears throat> with her uh, statue made by Julia Romano, and in the thief Autolycus. That is to say, I, th I see Shakespeare at the very end of his life as reflecting on what he, not on his marriage, but on his career, on what he had done, and I see him as dividing himself between a certain kind of uh, aristocratic magic which he hopes to be for forgiven for. If this be magic, let it be an art as lawful as eating, on the one hand, and, pocket, and picking pockets on the other. And I see him 
projecting himself powerfully there. So m there may be other reasons that I'm not thinking of as to why I didn't venture into this territory. It's, I suppose the other thing to say is that the marriage seems to me such a disaster, <laughs> uh, such a long-term disaster, that it was hard for me to believe that Shakespeare was naive enough to think that he could make it up. Because just at the time that he was or, uh, writing, I don't have the dates exactly in my head, but just at the time I think that he's writing The Winter's Tale, he's also finalizing the purchase of the Blackfriars Gatehouse. And the purchase of the Blackfriars Gatehouse, as far as we can tell, is a purchase whose form, legal form, can only be explained as an attempt to keep his wife from inheriting the bulk of his money, uh, to make sure that she doesn't get a damn thing. And I don't see that anyone who was dreaming that he was going to uh, sweetly reconcile himself uh, with Anne would be doing such a miserable thing uh, at that, I think, close to that moment. Shakespeare's character. What would you say if you met him? Everyone said he was gentle, but of course in the period uh, that term means something slightly different from what it means for us now. <clears throat> ben Johnson says that he would have been a fit companion for kings had he not been an entertainer of kings. Uh, he must have been a genial person by <clears throat> the accounts that left us. But he also seems to have been rather sober. You don't write two plays a year and run your company and make a lot of money if you're a great diner out and a party man. Uh, he was someone who seemed to have kept a considerable amount of time to himself. I think that he was enormously, unimaginably, imaginatively generous. He was hugely capable of conjuring up the lives not only of the kings and queens of his time, <clears throat> but of, of servants, uh, obscure, uh, degraded, uh, of blacks, of Jews, uh, of uh, nobodies. And at the same time, he was personally rather tight-fisted, canny, uh, careful, prudent, that the overflowing imaginative generosity sits in a disturbing paradoxical relation to a lifelong human prudence. And there was some thrift in money matters. Yes. This is a man who, when he had Hamlet writing those lines in the graveyard about the lawyer with his conveyances and <clears throat> his real estate deals, uh, writing, ha having Hamlet speak with marvelous aristocratic contempt of such a person was Making, writing conveyances and making real estate deals for himself in Stratford. So. Mm. Well, I think maybe <coughs> there are some questions from the audience. Uh, I see over there. You, perhaps you can stand up. Yes, thank you. I do very much think so. <clears throat> I very much think that <clears throat> he decided quite early on. I think the, I think the sight of your father hiding in his house, in your house, for fear of arrest for debt, concentrates the mind. Uh, I think he decided fairly early on. If he hadn't decided then, he certainly decided when he came to London and looked around at the people that he was hanging out with, almost all of whom died miserably in their late twenties, thirties. And he decided he, that isn't the way he was going to go. That he wasn't going to be uh, a failure. That there was nothing ennobling about bohemian poverty, or genteel poverty for that matter. That he was going to make some money at this game. Uh, and that it wasn't going to be incompatible from the highest level of aesthetic ambition uh, and deep feeling. But that there was going to be nothing ennobling in, for him and being a loser. Uh, and he did what he needed to do. There's a, there's a play that some of you may know by Edward Bond called Bingo, a marvelous play about Shakespeare's last years at Stratford. Bond just hates Shakespeare for what he was, what he became, for the real estate deals, <clears throat> for the uh, embouchoisement that he embraced. 
But as someone who has a mortgage himself, I feel less inclined to spit on the life of some plebeians. In collaboration with a professional playwright, I wrote a play uh, called uh, uh, Cardinio, uh, that is to say, a kind of reimagining of, <clears throat> of Shakespeare's lost play. So that's evidence of my completely taking leave of my senses. Uh, on the other hand, I'm in the early stage of a sober academic book about Poggio Bracciolini and the recovery of the <clears throat> uh, and recirculation of the text of Lucretius. Uh, in uh, Constance in the early uh, 15th century. So I hope to regain uh, whatever lost balance uh, I have experienced. There you go. Yes. Don't, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Mm. Mm. No, I mean, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Mm. <coughs> I was talking during the break to someone about this. Mm. It's not that there's no evidence about Shakespeare writing <coughs> Shakespeare's plays. There is actually quite a substantial body of evidence, starting with the fact that he was quite famous in his lifetime for writing, <coughs> for writing them. Mm. <coughs> about halfway through his career, his name starts appearing on his plays. It's, at the beginning, it, w it didn't appear because it was clearly not known. But halfway through it, not only does his name appear on, his, on the quarto versions of his plays, but it, his name begins to appear on plays that he hadn't written, uh, because obviously it's saleable as a commodity. Uh, there are allusions to Shakespeare by contemporaries, <clears throat> allusions to him as a writer, admiring references to his plays and to his poems. <clears throat> so there is actually a body of evidence and in the folio that was printed after his death, that folio was edited by two of his friends and fellow playwrights, Hemmings and Condell. It had a prologue, it had a preparatory, commendatory poem by his colleague, Ben Johnson. It had, uh, it had commendatory poems by Francis Beaumont, by Hugh Holland, by Leonard Diggs, all of whom knew Shakespeare. So if there was a conspiracy, it was a conspiracy in which many, many, many people would have been involved. And then there's a question of why there would be such a conspiracy. <clears throat> well, the people who like Edward de Vere have a strong pleasure in the idea of Edward de Vere because he has all the things that Shakespeare doesn't have. He's an aristocrat, a uh, fancy family, goes to, has a university degree, has a lot of money. <clears throat> he had one thing that was terribly problematical about him actually a number of things, but starting with one major thing. He died, poor guy, in 1604. <laughs> After 1604, the following plays of Shakespeare appeared in the world. Measure for Measure, Othello, All's Well That Ends Well, Time of Athens, King Lear, Macbeth, Antony Cleopatra, Pericles, Prince of Tyre, Coriolanus, Winter's Tale, Cymbeline, The Tempest, Henry VIII, and the two noble kinsmen. Now, the people who like the Oxfordian theory think that Oxford left all of these things 
uh, behind in manuscript. And that the conspirators released them in a kind of time release mode uh, for more than a decade uh, after his death under the fantastic conspiratorial uh, circumstances that it would have led Shakespeare, poor uh, Shakespeare, the conniving uh, beard of Avon, to cover this. What for? What's it about? It beyond finding someone of uh, the right social background and education. Well, I, there is something that it's about, I believe. But I say it's not completely, I think it's personally absurd, but I, don't, but I, I have come to respect the impulse behind it more than I used to. <clears throat> it's not simply the dream of <clears throat> an aristocrat or even the, you know, the, the conspiratorial fantasy of, of, uh, of a flying saucer. It's the, as I said, genuine problem of figuring out how it was possible for this work to have been created, first of all, by anyone, <clears throat> but second of all, by someone from a provincial background, middle class background, without a university education. And I've uh, tried to address this in every page of my book, not to address the question of the authorship controversy, because actually I don't think there's, like most scholars of my persuasion, I don't think there is an authorship, a serious authorship controversy, but there is a question, and it is a real question. And the dream of finding somebody else, a Marlowe who somehow survived this, the, this, the knife in his eye, or Francis Bacon who somehow found time uh, in his life to write these plays, or Queen Elizabeth uh, who uh, somehow survived her death in 1603, or this or that, some <laughs> other candidate. The, the, the impulse behind it is, it seems to me, a respectable impulse, not in those forms, but in the, in the form of saying, how is this possible? Someone, I shouldn't ever talk about uh, hostile reviews, I know, I know better than to do this, but someone wrote a hostile review uh, in which he was a, uh, he's a classicist, in which he said, he said, look, there's no mystery here any more than the mystery of how Aristotle could come from uh, Stagira and become who he became, Aristotle. I think that is a mystery, actually. <laughs> I read that, I thought, oh, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm bleeding on the floor. I think that's a real <laughs> question, if I knew anything about the sticks of Sajara and how you got from that to becoming Aristotle, I'd like to know it. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's certainly true. <coughs> yes. It's always there is a very interesting book that's not, this is not an answer to you. Remarked, but there was a very interesting book. Actually, it's not interesting. It's unbelievably hard work and boring, but it's a very important book uh, by Brian Vickers uh, on collaborative okay. authorship in Shakespeare, and it it does it it reviews an enormous body of evidence about collaboration. And this won't answer the question of who Shakespeare was and whether he was a beard or someone else, but it it comes to an extraordinarily conservative conclusion, which is that Shakespeare did indeed or the Shake, whoever was Shakespeare, did indeed collaborate on some of his plays. But they turn out, and the computer evidence seems to confirm this, but they're actually the worst plays that he wrote, I mean, which is very strange. <laughs> I would have had a much less conservative conclusion before this uh, about <laughs> this. I would have assumed that, that there was much more evidence of collaboration elsewhere in his work. I mean, it turns out that whenever anyone else got his hand into Shakespeare's work, the, work, the quality of the work seemed to have plummeted. That's very I'm sparkling. I'm so very glad that we're mm. back to the genius <coughs> of Shakespeare. That yeah. it really is, is, is a nice. Uh, <coughs> I think it's uh, uh, a good uh, moment to uh, give the word to. Uh,
Moni. First, I think a big hand for Stephen Greenblatt. I think you gave a wonderful speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Well, thank you for exposing yourself with uh, such a sore throat. I'm a little bit sorry for um, giving you this uh, moment in time. Thank you, David, for um, your introduction and for your wonderful questions. Thank you, audience, for being so involved. <laughs> Stephen, Professor Greenblatt, I should say, will sign his books on this table. You've seen there are books for, on sale uh, just uh, out there. Um, he will sign his books. There will be drinks uh, still at the bar. Uh, but before I will let you go, I would hope you give me one moment to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're going to do next year, because this is our last uh, lecture of this season. We want to bring to you more lectures in 2005. Our first one will be the 31st of January with Barbara Ehrenreich. She's a, a social scholar, and she will come here uh, because of a translation of her book, Nickel and Dimed. It's about social inequality in America. And it's, uh, the moderator will be Jan Donkers. Um, you can find information about that on our information table uh, of the John Adams Institute. And I want to tell you that we are totally independent. Uh, we are very much non-profit. All the people you see here are, except me and an assistant, all volunteers. And we can only do that because we have private sponsors, we have private companies who uh, try to donate a little bit of money, and also a lot of private people uh, do that. And you can already do that for 20 euros a year, and you will get our news cards and everything you can get from us. You get it, and you'll have priority bookings and everything. So if you are interested, please have a look at our um, information stand, and we would be very welcome to help you out. And we are very much looking forward to finding new people coming to our, I think, interesting lectures. Um, also, next year we'll have a special year because it was 225 years ago our namesake, na namesake John Adams came to Holland. Um, he said not uh, without reason suit, uh, food on Dutch soil because Holland was because um, I think of his, his, his uh, constant tryings, the second country to recognize the United States. Adams make this possible, and uh, we are very uh, busy planning a year with a little booklet. There's also a flyer of the new booklet with contributions of Hella Haas, uh, um, Willeboord Nieuwenhuis, and um, uh, there was an essay of Schulte Nordholt, the professor in American studies. You can find the flyer also on that table, and I think it's very interesting. There will be also a concert in the Concertgebouw based on the letters of John Adams, uh, which he wrote to his wife, Abby Gill, while he was in Amsterdam. So lots of things to find out about us, and I'm very, very happy you all came, and we all uh, listened very carefully to your talk. Thank you very much for coming, and have a safe journey back home. Thank you. Thank you.